The St. Valentine's Day Massacre was the darkest day in mob history. On February 14, 1929, assassins lined up seven men against the wall of a garage in Chicago and opened fire with Thompson submachine guns. News of the massacre sparked a national outcry to take down the mob and put an end to prohibition, which was fueling gang violence across the country. The bricks from that garage wall, as well as the ballistic evidence collected from the crime scene, are on permanent display in the Mob Museum. The Tommy guns used in the shooting are in the possession of the Berrien County Sheriff's Department in Southwest Michigan. On several occasions over the years, the Sheriff's Department has brought the Tommy guns to the museum for temporary display, creating a grim reunion of artifacts from that fateful day when, as one reporter put it, Chicago gangsters graduated from murder to massacre. My name is Mike Klein. I'm a retired operations lieutenant from the Berrien County Sheriff's Office uh, in St. Joseph, Michigan, which is uh, very, down in the very southwest corner of the state of Michigan, about 90 miles from Chicago. These are the St. Valentine's Day Massacre machine guns. They were used in the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. We know for a fact through ballistics testing and some new sciences and basically just through some luck. The guns that are on the tables here are called Model 1921 Colt Thompson submachine guns. It means they were manufactured in 1921. It was designed around the 45 ACP, which is an auto Colt pistol. It's a big, fat, heavy subsonic bullet that's basically designed to be a man stopper. The word Thompson, the name Thompson, comes from General John Thompson, who was the visionary who saw the need for a, a, a weapon like this for the military. World War I was going on, trench warfare, which was horrendous at the time, and he saw these as, as if it could be uh, engineered, designed, and developed where one man could carry a portable submachine gun. They had machine guns at the time, but it would take three or four people to haul them around, set them up, move them. They weren't really mobile. He wanted something that was compact, carried a lot of ammunition, fired at a very high, high rate of speed, and he envisioned that as a tool to be used by the military. His, his thought and theory was, you know, he says, war is terrible. But if you're going to fight a war, then let's win it. It took him forever to get the process, the engineering process down. 17 different prototypes they had to go through in order to get it to the ones that they finally decided on in this Model 1921 Thompson submachine gun. Originally of those Model 21s, they produced 15,000 and then they stopped production. They weren't selling. They couldn't get rid of them. John Thompson was about ready to cash in his chips, get rid of the patent and move on to something else when you started to have payroll security outfits, bank uh, security, uh, railroad yards, where there was a lot of thieving and, and, and things going on, they, they started to equip their security people with Thompson submachine guns. One example I give, big ranches out west. There's, a, there's one of the advertisements from Colt and it shows a, a ranch hand, a guy standing there with his chaps on and he's got his 10 gallon hat and his vest on. He's standing in the front of the bunkhouse and he's got a Thompson with a 50 round drum on it. And he says, it says, the caption says, out west, the great equalizer. So like one cowboy could hold off a whole bunch of, you know, bad guys with one Thompson. And it didn't get used in World War I, but it was pretty much turf wars in the, in the United States. At the time, you would walk into your local sporting goods store, you'd plop down $175, and you could walk out with a fully automatic Thompson submachine gun. There was no gun control, but at the same time, law enforcement couldn't get them. I mean, a Ford Model A cost $400. Okay, so the gangsters could afford them. Police departments couldn't. They were poor. They would love to have a squad car much more than a big heavy machine gun that they're not hardly ever going to use. So you had the St. Valentine's Day massacre. Four guys are there dressed as police officers. Two have Tommy guns, two have shotguns. They got those hidden, of course, though. They have the seven men line up against the wall and uh, they pull out the weapons and open fire. And just a matter of seconds, all seven men are down on the ground. Yeah. When the dust and smoke all settle, six of the seven are dead right away. One guy is still alive when the real police get there, and he's got a few holes in him. His name is Frank Gusenberg, and uh, they're rushing him to the hospital. They asked him, who shot you, Frank? And he allegedly said, nobody shot me. He didn't want to be a rat, right? Nobody um, shot me. You can't really have the police investigating the police. i got to lead into this a little bit because um, Capone and his guys used to come into our area. 
uh, southwest Michigan. We're 90 miles away from Chicago. Beautiful beaches, resorts. They would come, he would bring his guys, and they started to spend time there. They would relax, they'd spend their money, never caused any problems. And uh, they had uh, you know, places that would set them up, uh, hotels that would they could rent, the, take the top floor. They were insulated, they had, didn't have any problems with the exception of like 10 months after the St. Valentine's Day Massacre, one of the employees of, of Capone's crew, this guy by the name of Fred Burke. And basically he was just a contract guy. Uh, when you needed a job done, you got a hold of Fred Burke. And he had a couple guys that were his left-hand guys and they were pretty much hitters. I mean, this is what they did. You needed somebody eliminated, you went and got Fred Burke. Well, he had spent enough time in St. Joe, in Benton Harbor, in the Stevensville area, that he had purchased a home. He was in town, it's December 14th, 1929, 10 months after St. Valentine's Day Massacre. Uh, he's been drinking a little bit. He starts to head into town. He's gonna pick his wife up at the train station. He has a little fender bender, which then puts him in contact with these people and uh, it doesn't get resolved real well. Uh, they, he ends up fleeing them. Uh, they come into town and they're talking to Officer Charles Skelly of the St. Joseph Police Department. And in so doing, uh, they're explaining, hey, this guy who's drunk, hit our car, took off, you know, we want money, blah, blah, blah. Well, Fred drives through the intersection. He's continued into town to go pick his wife up at the train station. This then uh, gives uh, Skelly the ability to mount onto a vehicle, Forrest Cool's car, the guy that got the car hit, and they follow him a couple blocks they have a confrontation. Burke ends up shooting Officer Skelly in an intersection, drops him, takes off, wrecks his car. We, as in the Berrien County Sheriff's Department, get a call, say, hey, wrecked car, man with a gun. So we go to this wrecked car, and in the back seat, we find a receipt to a lumber yard, which then leads us to this house in Stevensville. And we get there, Fred's not there. He hasn't shown up yet. Uh, his wife is there. We question her. We start looking around the house, and that's when we find Fred Burke's toolkit. It's got three bulletproof vests, it's got two Thompson machine guns, a couple rifles, shotguns, thousands of rounds of ammunition, safe cracking tools, uh, tear gas grenades, uh, disguises, and 300,000 some odd dollars in banknotes from a bank in Wisconsin that had been robbed about a month prior. So we now have all this. this we don't have Fred, we've got an officer that's died, uh, but we put it out over the wires. We're looking for Fred Burt, killed Officer Skelly. Chicago contacts us and said, hey, we've been looking for Fred too ever since this little thing happened on Valentine's Day. It kind of got his uh, handiwork all over it. They say, we've got this guy at Northwestern University. His name is Dr. Calvin Goddard, and he's doing this thing called ballistic forensics. It's a new science. And they said he would like to check those firearms and that ammunition out. So we do, we, we take him over there. Uh, he's been set up at Northwestern University because of, they, well, they wanted him separated from law enforcement because of all the corruption. And they wanted him to do his thing. And we did, we took the guns over and he sees some things right away. The, the same ammunition that was used at the St. Valentine's Day Massacre, the 45 ACP. Burke's got bags and bags of it from his cottage that we raided. Light bulb goes off, they test fire these two guns. They have the shell casings and the ammunition from the crime scene that Goddard did after the bodies went to the morgue and all that, and compares them, and lo and behold, these, that's when we confiscated the two St. Valentine's Day Massacre guns. The St. Valentine's Day Massacre had a profound effect on the public's opinion about mobsters, about prohibition itself. It was such a heinous crime that it just woke people up to the fact that even though these bootleggers were providing liquor that people wanted, the violence associated with that was just so great that it was something that people could not live with anymore. The St. Valentine's Day Massacre caught the attention of the federal government, even up to the President of the United States, Herbert Hoover, who said, we need to figure out how to get Al Capone and put him in prison. This is a guy who had been flouting the law for years and they needed to find a way to, to, to take him down. And the federal government did not have a lot of law enforcement agencies at that time, and they really needed to bulk up the law as well as the personnel to, you know, to take on something as big as the mob. When the St. Valentine's Day Massacre occurred, a man named Calvin Goddard was brought in from New York to Chicago 
to examine this ballistic evidence from the crime scene of the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. And he was able to show that the bullets that were fired on that day matched these two Tommy guns that were found later in Michigan. And it was just a very big step for ballistics testing in this country. So the bricks behind me are from the original wall of the North Clark Street garage in Chicago where the St. Valentine's Day Massacre occurred. In 1967, this building was going to be torn down. And a man named George Patey understood the historical significance of this building and of these bricks in particular. And so he decided to acquire the bricks. The building was torn down. And he numbered and lettered the bricks very carefully so that the wall could be recreated to look as it did on the day when the shooting occurred. So Patey took these bricks and he put them in a variety of different places. They were in a nightclub at one point. They were in different ways. He was promoting uh, the St. Valentine's Day Massacre and these bricks as these artifacts that he had acquired. He was quite a showman. And so when he put them out on display, he wanted them to have a dramatic effect. So one of the things he did is he, he painted red paint onto some of the bricks uh, to make it look like blood. It's obviously not blood, but what it does do is accentuate some of the pockmarks in the, some of the bricks that show where errant bullets during the course of the massacre hit the wall. But because they are artifacts, we're not inclined to go and remove the paint uh, that would just perhaps damage the bricks. George Patey, uh, when he passed away, uh, the bricks were inherited by his niece. And his niece, when she saw that the Ma Museum was being developed, that the Ma Museum would be a logical place for the bricks. So the deal was made. The Ma Museum acquired the bricks in 2009. They were reassembled here, and uh, they are probably the premier artifact in the museum. So the evidence from the crime scene of St. Valentine's Day Massacre, a portion of that is contained right here at the Ma Museum. And we have the coroner's reports. We have test bullets that were fired to determine whether guns were a match with the guns that were used in the massacre. We have the bullets that were actually removed from the bodies of the victims, the seven victims of the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. The coroner sheets that show the bullet entry and exit wounds for each victim. And all of this evidence just helps to understand just how brutal this crime was within this garage on the north side of Chicago. The evidence that was missing for you know 80 plus years and, and now have that here all together and on display. So when we, do the, when we do this on Valentine's Day and we have the wall, we have the evidence, we have the guns, and I'm standing in front of the wall where these guys got massacred and I get this like, just, I, I, my hairs are standing up and I'm just like, okay, you know, this is kind of not right, but I guess I go, it is right. <laughs> you know, so it is what it is. It's very special, yeah. Because any part of it could be missing. If, if the guy buys the garage, tears it down, and doesn't care about the bricks in the wall, they're gone. Um, this guy who has the evidence uh, up in Wisconsin, and, and he decides he's just going to hang on to it or disperse it here and there piece by piece, it doesn't stay as a collection. If Burke isn't drunk and stupid in downtown St. Joe, kills Officer Skelly, we may never have ever found these guns. They might have just disappeared. So, I mean, it's like, think of the luck of all of it.